Hello and welcome, I'm Glenn Fay, Research Fellow here at CIS. A better education is a ticket to a brighter future for many children. But too many are trapped in a cycle of disadvantage, never gaining the tools to succeed by the time they leave school. To blame is an education orthodoxy that puts disadvantaged students in the too hard basket. Not enough's done to turn around the fortunes of children who look to education to give them a better shot in life. But disadvantage mustn't be destiny for Australia's students. And CIS research shows there are schools out there who are successfully overcoming the educational odds. There are common practices among high-performing disadvantaged schools. A school-wide commitment to high expectations and a disciplined environment. Direct and explicit instruction in classrooms. Strong leadership and collaboration among teachers. These high-performing schools make a difference every day improving the lives of their students. And perhaps there's no better example of a school doing just that than London-based Michaela Community School. In 2019, more than half its school leavers achieved the equivalent of an A grade, more than two and a half times the national average. That's helped to earn them international praise. So how has Michaela achieved such success and how can more of Australia's schools replicate it here? To discuss this, I'm pleased to introduce the woman responsible for setting up and leading these efforts. Catherine Burble Singh is principal and founder of Michaela Community School. She's also the editor of the books, Battle Him of the Tiger Teachers, and Michaela, The Power of Culture. Catherine, a warm welcome to the CIS and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Catherine, for those of us in our audience who aren't familiar with, with Michaela, can you tell us a little bit about the journey setting up the school uh, and what you had to overcome in order to get there? Yeah, well, um, uh, in 2010, free schools were made a possibility here in Britain, uh, which are basically a sort of copy of the charter schools in America. Uh, they are normal state schools, but um, you are able as a group of people to set up your own school. And then you can get funding from government and it is a state school. It has a normal admissions policy. Everything about it is kind of normal, apart from the fact that you've got this group of people who set it up and you have to go through a kind of application process through the Department for Education. And so um, that's what we did. Uh, I had given a speech in 2010 at the Conservative Party conference uh, here in Britain, which got me in a lot of trouble. And I was sort of booted out of state education. And people told me I would never work for a state school again. And I'd spent my whole life working with disadvantaged children. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? So I thought, right, I'll set up my own school with this new process now of free schools. So it took us three and a half years because we had a lot of detractors who were fighting us. They fought us partly because they hated me because I'd spoken at the Conservative Party conference. And I'm not a member of the Conservative Party or anything like that, but it's simply unthinkable really for a teacher to kind of side with the Conservatives as I'd done. So uh, they hated me for that, but they also hated what the school, uh, you know, the, 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 the possible school stood for. We believed and still believe in tradition, uh, high standards of discipline, um, teacher-led learning from the front of the classroom with explicit teaching. Um, so we were very anti-progressive. And as there are lots of progressives in the world of teaching, um, they tried very hard to stop us. And which is why it took us three and a half years to eventually open, uh, but we did. And we have this building, it's not the best building in the world, right next to the trains. We have no fields, we have no trees. You know, we don't even have a car park for the staff because the car park that there is, is essentially the playground for the children. But I always say that what makes a school is the people inside. And um, we are doing great things. And we get over 600 visitors a year, some from Australia actually, um, who come here, often teachers, it's mainly teachers who come from all over the world. Uh, to see what we do and they take ideas of ours back to their schools and make things better. So it's a real thrill to be part of what I would say is a real movement here in Britain uh, to return things more to the traditional, the, the stuff that works <laughs> and, um, and, and to change the lives, not just of uh, disadvantaged kids, because those are our kids, we're in the inner city, to give your um, uh, listeners an idea, you know, uh, there are kids carrying knives in the inner city, uh, kids who, who get killed by local gangs uh, or a South London gang comes up and deals with the North London gang. Um, you know, one of our kids a couple of years ago coming out of his uh, GCSE exams was attacked by some of the other kids from another school and was stabbed a few times with a compass. Um, kids come on bikes with masks on and this is, you know, not because they're 
they're worried about COVID, you know, they're wearing masks because <laughs> they're covering their faces and um, waiting for our boys to come out of school, you know, that, that just to give a sense, this is very much the mm -hmm. inner city. Uh, and we, you know, there's loads of disadvantaged kids here. So, um, and we, we managed to do great work with them, I would say, because of our traditional values and our traditional teaching methods and our high expectations of behaviour. So that's that. You've worked in disadvantaged schools, as you've alluded to, not just in London, but of course, all over the world at different times. And I think one, one thing that strikes me as someone working in the education space is that of course, that, that space is very much dominated by progressive perspectives about disadvantage. And one of the concerns that I take and has always struck me is that to me, disadvantaged students seem to be put in a too hard basket a lot of the time by policymakers and educators. But do you think that there's too much complacency among policymakers, educators in allowing disadvantaged uh, students to effectively go on failing at school? It's not so much that it's complacency, it's that they've got all the wrong ideas about what should help these kids. <laughs> so they think to themselves wrongly that they need to make stuff relevant for the children. So it's not just policymakers, it's also teachers in their own classroom. They think, oh, these children can't really access Shakespeare, either because they're not the right color or they come from a single parent family or they're poor or whatever it is. And so, you know, if you're white and middle class, they think, of course, you can access Shakespeare. But if you're not, then you can't unless you make Shakespeare, you know, you access it through a rap or you, you, <laughs> you make it more relevant to the kids as opposed to just reading Shakespeare. And I really don't understand that because it, Shakespeare is difficult to access whatever color you are, whatever whatever a class you are, um, because it's Shakespeare and he wrote 400 years ago. Um, and what it takes is a teacher who's really fascinated by it and wants to inspire the kids and teaching them properly. That requires traditional teaching methods. And when I say they just got the wrong ideas, the progressives think that the way to help disadvantaged children is to get them out of their chairs, for instance, in the classroom and put post-its on their foreheads and get them running around and doing fun activities because they think otherwise they can't engage these kids. And it's really about, it's because these kids are so other to them that they think they're not just kids and they are just kids, right? And actually mm -hmm. for kids to learn, you just need to teach them. You need to stand in front of the class and when I talk about explicit teaching, what I mean by that is really great explanations where the teacher knows that they are in charge and they are leading the learning. Too often in a progressive classroom or in progressive poly policymakers' heads, they think what's required is to make it more fun. And that actually makes it impossible to access. So when you're getting up out of your, 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 your seat and going around and post-it notes and playing games and so on, as opposed to the teacher just leading the learning and you're sat in a, row, in, a, in a row of desks being led by the teacher, what happens is the most disadvantaged children in that classroom fall off because they, they can't keep up with the moving around. And so they don't have enough background knowledge in their heads to be able to support them through that activity. And so it's not the d disadvantaged kids, that, it's not that they're complacent about them. It's that the very methods that they put into practice to help these kids are the methods that destroy these kids, right? That, that, that's the thing. Earlier this year, we had the pleasure of hosting Indigenous leader Noel Pearson to discuss scaling up success in majority Indigenous schools. Here's what he had to say. I believe that Indigenous education will not be fixed up until we get education fixed up for all students particularly disadvantaged ones. The important point that is lost about direct and explicit instruction is that they are non-categorical approaches to t learning and teaching. We don't distinguish between human learners. And that's exactly the point, isn't it? That direct and explicit instruction are completely appropriate for learners of all kinds. Why is it that people oppose this? Well, it's really interesting. So when I went, I was in Australia about five, six years ago, I went to visit a number of schools and I went to visit a school with a number of Aboriginal children in there. And uh, we, there was lots of guitar playing. The teachers were playing guitars. Sorry, those are our pips, you know, changeover <laughs> of lessons. And um, the teachers were playing guitars and the children were doing lots of singing. And I was there for some time listening to lots of lovely singing. And I said, well, are we going to see any maths lessons or any English lessons? 
And they said, oh, well, we tend to do a lot of singing, you know. And I said, well, but I'd love to see some maths. And the general conversation that I'd have with the teachers was sort of, well, look, these kids are going to end up in prison anyway. So let's have fun while we're in school because this is a nice time for them. What's the point of putting them under pressure to make them do something really hard like maths when we can sing and be happy? And so, and that example there is very similar to the sort of thing I see over here in the way that we might talk about our white working class children in the North, for instance. Well, it's too hard for them. So let's make it fun and relevant and nice. And as I say, post-it notes, jumping out of your chairs, playing games in the classroom. And people think that playing these games or singing songs or whatever it is, um, that that makes it fun for the kids. And actually I'd say real fun is learning something and getting over an obstacle that you thought you couldn't otherwise get over. So you look at a piece of music and you think, gosh, how would I ever play that on an instrument? You work hard at it and then you get, you, you manage it and you think, yeah. Or you look at some maths questions, you think, oh my goodness, how do I do this? But your teacher leads that learning, teaches you how to do it. And at the end you go, wow, I did well in the test. I never thought I could. That is real fun. The kind of fun that the progressives push is superficial type of fun that makes the teachers or the policymakers feel good about themselves because they see smiling, happy brown children and they go, wow, look, we're making it fun and lovely for them. But I tell you what's not fun is being illiterate for your life or being enumerate. And they say, oh, but is that really happening? Yes, that is happening. And so they, they can often deny that these are the problems. You know, they're functionally illiterate, functionally enumerate. And then what they say is, well, these kids can't get jobs because of racism and so on. And I'm not saying racism doesn't exist. It very much does. But the fact is that if you have been let down by your school system and you haven't been taught the basics, you know, basic knowledge of history of your country, basic building blocks of science. So, you know, a little bit maybe of a foreign language, English and maths. If you can't sit down and read, especially in the day and age of uh, technology now where kids have phones and they're on there for hours and hours. And just banning phones, for instance, some schools don't do that. You know, we go even further than just banning phones in the school. We are strongly encouraging parents not to get them phones at all. And the thing is, is that too many people in education uh, blame stuff like poverty or race or, um, you know, funding for schools. And I'm not saying those things aren't a problem. I will never say no to more money. You know, government want to give me more money. I'm more than happy to have it. Right. But the fact is we have a terrible building with no fields, no grass, no uh, car park for the staff. These trains that make so much noise right next to the school. Uh, we have a really hard time. Having said that, we've got an amazing school. And that's about the mm -hmm. ideas. There are too many bad ideas in education. And what we need is for teachers themselves, because the policymakers, I'm not think, I don't think they're going to listen. And the reason why they don't listen is they have no real, um, you know, direct contact with children. So they don't know. The disadvantaged children that they say they're trying to help, they've never met. So there's no point in trying to convince them. You know, the people who we need to convince are the teachers. And that's what I try and do here. You know, with our school, we invite everybody to come and visit us. All of your listeners, welcome to come. Get on a plane at some point when you're allowed to do so. And come and visit us here in, in England. Come to London, come and sit and have lunch with the children, have a tour with them, see what we can achieve, see what's possible with disadvantaged children in the inner city. Because it is possible if you've got the right methods and if you've got the right values. And unfortunately, in 2021, the values of personal responsibility, having a duty towards others, uh, picking yourself up when you get knocked down and keeping on going and not blaming everybody else around you, those kinds of values are very rare, unfortunately, in 2021 and are unfashionable. And so I get attacked quite a lot for having those values. But it does not help disadvantaged children to keep telling them that the world is against them. What they've got is their lot in life. And maybe it isn't fair. Sure, it's not fair that some kids are born rich and some kids are born poor. But you've only got one life. That's my point. You've only got one life. And the best thing you can do is get educated, work hard, and make the most of what you've got. And um, I think, unfortunately, uh, the progressives don't see it that way. They, they unfortunately are undermining often those kinds of values, both in the media and just in the general society. And then they stand against schools like ours who are really trying to change the lives of these disadvantaged kids. Uh, Catherine, I'd like to talk a bit about the school culture at Michaela. Now, 
every educator knows that a school's culture makes all the difference, but it's a difficult one to, I suppose, necessarily identify a good culture, a bad culture. And, and at the same time, it also costs nothing to have a conducive culture in school that promotes success and has high expectations, but sadly is not found enough in disadvantaged schools where expectations sometimes are lowered and, and sometimes there's a culture arguably of excuses rather than uh, high expectations uh, for, for all their students. Why do you think that is? And, and how have you addressed that at Michaela? Yeah, it's interesting because you say any educator knows that uh, culture is really important. I don't think most of them do know at all, actually. I think uh, most people don't realize the power of culture. Our second book is called The Power of Culture for that very reason. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't realize. So I see on Twitter, for instance, uh, people attacking a, a school that sort of copied us with chanting of poetry. So we have the kids memorize poetry and then they chant poetry. And that head teacher came to visit us the other day here and he was saying how at the end of lunch and at the end of break, they had so many behavior incidents, another inner city school like ours. I mean, they had so many behavior incidents, the pastoral team, their, their whole afternoons and late mornings was taken up dealing with those behavior incidents. Now they've got the kids in the yard, in, in lines, chanting poetry. Guess what? They don't have any more behavior incidents. Right? <laughs> now, when you say to yourselves, oh, let's chant poetry, you don't think, oh, and that's in order to stop the behavior incidents. That's not why. The reason you want them to chant poetry is because poetry is beautiful. It's lovely to know some poems by heart. It's a traditional uh, uh, activity and it's something that I love children to do. But isn't that fascinating? The culture of his school completely changed so that now he doesn't have all those behavior incidents. I don't think people realize just enough how much culture can be influenced by various strategies, by various expectations that you can have. Now you ask why, and it's a good question, why would you lower your expectations for some children? I think it's because teachers can feel very guilty about their own privilege. So they probably were quite bright, they will have gone to university, maybe they came from nice backgrounds with good families and so on. So they think to themselves, gosh, I didn't worry for anything when I was growing up and I had a mom who was always there reading to me when I was younger, they feel bad. And so when they see a child who doesn't necessarily have mom and dad at home or who is, comes from poverty or who's brown or black or whatever the thing is that makes him different to the teacher, the teacher thinks, well, it would be wrong for me to expect the same things of him as I would do of my own children because my own children are privileged. He isn't privileged and I don't want to be a mean person. And so I'm going to say it's OK when he doesn't do his homework because I understand life is difficult for him in the home. What the teacher isn't thinking about in that moment is, yes, but in five years, what does that mean for that child? If he never has to do his homework and he's never held to account and we don't give him detentions for poor behavior because we imagine that his poor behavior is because of his home situation, then he never learns how to behave. He never learns how to do his homework. He never learns his times tables. And then when he leaves school, he's functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate. And that means his whole life is ruined. Now, the teacher doesn't think to herself in that moment, I want to ruin this child's life because I don't like brown children or I don't like poor children. That isn't the case. The, 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 what I would call racism, the bigotry of low expectations, because it's not just against brown and black kids, this also happens against white kids um, but, and against poor kids and so on. That bigotry of low expectations uh, is, it comes from a sort of nice place. <laughs> it comes from the teacher not wanting to be mean. But it, you have to hold the line with children and do what is supposedly mean in order to get the best out of them and to give them the best possible chances at life. And that's something that teachers can struggle with. I would say the number one thing that I struggle, I struggle with and that I um, have to kind of encourage in my teachers is to hold the line. Most teachers don't want to give the detention. Most teachers just want to say, oh, it's all right, don't worry, I won't, I won't, I won't give you the detention this time. Um, people often think of us as, well, we hate children. And so that's why we give detentions. Quite the opposite. I have to strongly encourage my, my teachers to make sure that they don't let those children down and that they hold their standards high for every child in their classroom. And it's something that um, I think all school leaders should be doing. But even school leaders feel bad about their own privilege and so on. So, it, it, and it's hard when the rest of the world is telling you that you're mean and nasty and that you hate children. 
you have to have quite a, a strong backbone to stand up to that and say, no, actually, I'm doing what's right for these kids. While we're on the issue of expectations, uh, a question from our audience, uh, Peter asks us, how is it that despite the, the level of uh, expectations that you set in your school, there's also those external expectations set by uh, centralised, standardised assessments, those sorts of things. And an issue that, of course, exists here in Australia and elsewhere is that in some respects, we're also at the mercy of other elements about grade inflation of, of, other, of those other assessments. So how do you ensure that high expectations remains your mantra at school, even if the rest of the system doesn't? Yeah, well, I have to say we're lucky because in 2010, Michael Gove was the education secretary and he changed things somewhat in terms of our, our GCSE exams and made them much more rigorous. And we're still living with that system. So actually, we don't have those issues that you will have in Australia. And I do understand, well, I say we don't have them. I mean, yes, in comparison to the way things were 50 years ago, things have been dumbed down. But they more recently, thing, we, 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 the government tried to address that, is what I'd say. Uh, I think that uh, families, parents really need to get involved in the education of their own children. You cannot, I think one of the, look, I'm a great believer in state education. Obviously, it's my whole life. I believe in it. However, I think that it can undermine uh, parental responsibility for their own children and that parents have this sense of, well, I'll just shunt my child off to school and school will teach him. And it's not my job to teach my child. And I would say to all parents, it is absolutely your job to teach your child. And if school teaches him as well, well, great. But don't expect the school to do everything because some schools are better than other schools. Some teachers are better than other teachers. In fact, data an analysis of this demonstrates that children, uh, that teachers in one school, the difference between an excellent teacher and a not so good teacher in one school is far greater than the difference between teachers at X school in comparison to Y school. And the parents often think, if I just get my child into the good school, he'll be okay. I promise you, some of his teachers will not be great. And that's the case in any profession. I'm not knocking teachers. The fact is you have good doctors and not so good doctors. You've got good management consultants and not so good management consultants. Mm -hmm. It's the same in teaching. So every parent needs to take responsibility. And the fact is that if, the, if you feel the curriculum is dumbed down and your child isn't being stretched, well, stretch him at home. Because it ain't going to happen in your child's lifetime that <laughs> everything's going to transform with the policymakers. You know, maybe one day you'll get an equivalent of Michael Gove in Australia who will come in and go, right, we need to get things back to basics and we need to have tradition and blah, blah. Maybe that's going to happen. I wouldn't hold your breath. Parents take responsibility. While we're on parents, I know that it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people in education do take a view that, well, a lot of disadvantage starts in the home and stays in the home and there's only so much that they can really do about turning that around. And I suppose that's where the complacency is that, that I sometimes see in education. But you've, what you've highlighted there is a, a, a real partnership with parents. Why is it that, what is it that's being done differently in that engagement with parents compared to maybe neighboring schools uh, or other schools that, that you've seen in, uh, in your experience? Well, I'm very hard with parents. <laughs> I don't suppose it comes as a surprise. I say to them, they need to, uh, they need to get better at parenting. And I'm very straightforward with them. I say to them that they need to think of us as like a personal trainer. You know, when you go to the gym, you know it's really hard. And so you hire a personal trainer because you want the personal trainer to shout at you and say, do another push up, come on, you can do better, you can do better. And that's kind of what we do. And so I say to the parents, the homework isn't done. I'm holding you in here to ask you what's going on. So uh, the parents are held to account. You don't get them in on time. You don't have them in the proper uniform. The homework isn't done properly. I'm holding you to account. We are going to deliver on our side. We are going to deliver excellent teaching in every classroom, the, the wonderful, beautiful silent corridors where the children rush quickly to their lessons. It is, a, it is a beautiful thing to see what happens in our school, but I expect you to hold up your side of the bargain. And I think too often with state education, as I said before, parents just farm their children out to the state and think that the state should look after it. And while I'm a huge advocate, obviously my whole life is about improving state education and about getting our teachers in from all over the world to help encourage them to make classrooms better. I also believe that it is a parental, it is a parental duty to make sure that you are supporting their learning at home and frankly, even extending their learning at home. So I do, we do that with parents. So on Monday, for instance, I have a parents meeting where 200 of our parents will come. I do a kind of parent assembly where the parents sit 
and listen to my advice about what they need to be doing at home better. So normally what would happen at a parent meeting in, uh, in, in most schools is that they come, they ask the teacher how they're doing, and they get a grade, they get a report, and then they go home. And while we do reports with the parents and so on, the parent meetings, when they come in, they're getting advice from me on how to be better parents. So I give them advice, for instance, on how to navigate the internet, how to make sure their child isn't sat on their phone all the time, how to uh, uh, supervise their internet uh, use, how to be really clear about what homework we're setting so that they know how to monitor that at home, what their homework diary looks like and how the, the parent can monitor that. Um, I go into details about bedtime. We sell alarm clocks. We sell brick phones in the school so that parents cannot give their child a smartphone and instead give a brick phone. Get an alarm clock so that the child doesn't have the phone in the bedroom at night so the they're not up all night until two in the morning and then actually sleeping through their lessons during the day. There are all sorts of things like that that we go through with parents so parents are clear on their role on how to support their child. I don't think schools do that so much. They see their role as, well, we teach and then we tell the school how your child is doing. Uh, we very much want to try and make parents better at parenting. Well, you've highlighted a couple of times there that the role of technology in the home and technology in school, you know, and, and, and in some respects, you're quite different to perhaps the, the conventional approaches these days around uh, the use of devices. What's different in the approach you're taking about device use in school and also at home? Yeah. So um, parents, you know, when you're choosing a school for your child, if they're on their devices in school, run from the school, right? That's my advice. Run as far as you can go, right? The fact is that any sensible school ought to ban devices during the school day. I mean, that's just a minimum as far as I'm concerned, because if they're on their phones, I mean, I, I should be saying something that's obvious here. If they're on their phones during the school day, they're on Snapchat and Instagram. They are not uh, doing wonderful research about a project as people might imagine is going on. They are kids. So um, now that's just in school. Some schools mm -hmm. take them in at the beginning of the day, give them back at the end of the day. I don't know, people div do different things. Doesn't matter what the system is, make sure they don't have them out during the school day. We then go further than that and strongly encourage families not to give their child a phone at all. And so I would say lots of our families listen to us and don't give their child a phone. Um, and it's really interesting because like my head of year 10 was saying to me, he came in saying, look, success, Catherine, look at this. My top 10 kids here in my, in my year group who are performing, they don't have a phone. None of them have a phone. Parents have listened to us. And he said, and look back now to those kids when we were in year seven, the top 10 who are no longer the top 10, right? <laughs> they all have a phone, right? So those top 10 kids who have a phone used to be in year seven over the last three years, the kids who don't have a phone have now overtaken them. That's the kind of thing that I tell families. So families are encouraged not to have a phone at all. If they do have a phone, we have a digital detox system here at school. We have a big safe. The kids can hand in their phone whenever they want. And then they, we keep it for two or three days. They get it back. So a lot, some kids give it in on a Monday, get it back on a Friday. And that's because they're too addicted to give it up completely. But they have it on the weekend. But at least Monday to Friday, they give their brains a break. What people don't realize is that your brain is actually getting broken when you're on that phone all the time or on the screen all the time, let alone the kind of horrible uh, interaction that people have online. It breaks their moral core is what I'd say as and a child being exposed to the kind of language, the horrible things that they say. I mean, you cannot imagine in the inner city. I, I, I couldn't tell you the things that they'd say because it, 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 you'd have to bleep out everything I was saying, you know? <laughs> um, and so you want to protect your child from that. Parents, uh, mistakenly think that their child is more safe with the phone. They're actually far less safe. One, they're less safe on the street because people rob them for the phone. And two, they're less safe because it means every pedophile, every gang member out there knows where your child lives, know who knows who they speak to, knows who their friends are, knows the route to school and children get groomed. And it is, a, it is a really dangerous thing. So I will show parents videos from mothers out there who are campaigning because their children have actually been killed because of their unsupervised access to the internet, let alone, I mean, that's the, that's your physical safety. Then there's just their, their, the levels of anxiety and depression, mental health issues that have skyrocketed over the last five to six years, all down to the, 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 uh, the, 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 the access, the, uh, the, you know, the unrestricted access that children have to social media. So that is something that parents are normally uninformed about. 
the children are far more technologically advanced than the parents are, and they run rings around them. So parents need huge amounts of support and understanding this sort of stuff. We give it to our parents. I'm not so sure all schools are. In fact, schools can make it much more difficult for parents because they set loads of homework online, and we do too. So I'm not saying I, I understand the, the the ease and the the, the the wonders of the internet. So I'm not a total uh, luddite. You know, I I do get and we use. Uh, uh, um, the internet for homework as well, but we're very restricted about it and we think very carefully about it and we inform parents just how long it is so that they can watch their children. Because where parents are really confused, I find in other schools is that they're saying, but how can I take, how can I take it away when the school wants them on the internet all the time? The, the school wants the child to take the phone out in the school, in, in, in the school classrooms. So that's somewhere where I think schools are going badly wrong. And because it's a new technology, um, Schools aren't really caught up on that yet. I do think in 50 years, we will look back and think, my God, what did we do? Thanks for everybody that's contributing to the conversation online. I'd, I'd like to just combine two questions here. Thanks, Grant, and thanks, David, for your questions. How is it, how is it that you gain commitment from parents in schools? And particularly when things don't work out, if parents aren't holding their end of the bargain, what, what do you do to, I suppose, take action when, when that's the case? Yeah, I mean, I'd say lots, many of our parents, in, in nearly all of our parents don't meet my expectations because <laughs> my expectations are very high. Um, so I explain that to them. But the fact is, notice like with digital detox. So we've said to the parents, don't buy them phones. A number of parents don't listen to us. So then we deal directly with the child. We're trying to encourage the child to give up their phone. So when the child is giving us their phone from Monday to Friday or whatever it is, it's the child who's made that decision. It's not the parent. The child has understood our arguments to say, look, you know, I will stand up at assembly and I will say to them very straightforwardly, look, maybe you're lucky enough to have a parent who gets it and who's supportive with, uh, on you and is, 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 uh, is super disciplined and doesn't let you have uh, uh, unsupervised access to the internet. But if you're not so lucky to have a parent like that, then you need to do it yourself and you need to give us your phone. You need to understand what we're saying. And that's just really sad because a lot of disadvantaged children don't have parents who are going to do that sort of thing. But, well, what else can you do? If the parent refuses to do it, I mean, we've got parents who are alcoholics, parents who are, have all sorts of issues, parent, absent fathers, you know, I mean, huge numbers of them, right? Like, I can't force that father to be in the home. If I can't get the parents on board, or if I can only get the parents on board somewhat, we have to help the child to, to, to do the rest of it, to do the rest of whatever he can. That's, that's all you can do. Catherine, your critics um, uh, pejoratively label the school as being Britain's strictest school. But in fact, I, I, you know, if I understand correctly, you, you really wear that as a badge of honour, though, because uh, of the role that school discipline plays. And of course, as I alluded to earlier, in CIS research, one of the common elements that we found is that schools with higher levels of discipline are, are by far better performers despite disadvantaged settings. What is it that you do differently? And is it really draconian to have a sense of order and organization at school? Well, I mean, that's the point. You know, they want to call me the strictest headmistress in Britain. Well, go right ahead. I mean, they think that that means I hate children. It actually means you love children. The stricter you are, the more you love them. Because as I said, the most difficult part of my job is trying to make sure my teachers give detentions, right? So when you care about yourself and how you feel, you don't give detentions. Because what matters to you is, oh, it makes me feel bad. I don't want to do it. But when you care about the child more than you care about yourself, then you hold them to account because it's hard to hold children to account because, well, you'd rather just let them go because you feel bad, right? So the fact is, the stricter you are, the more you love them. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going around whipping them with chains. I mean, it's just a completely ridiculous, you know, uh, suggestion. We have Trunchbull in our, uh, in our you know, Roald Dahl's uh, headmistress. We've, we've, got a, we've got her in our, in our eyes, you know, you must hate children. No, it's because we love children that we do this. And so you want to narrate to children why you do these things. Our children understand so much of the power of detention that they will actually thank their teachers. Thanks for giving me a detention, sir, because it's taught me a lesson. They, they will say that. Now, people say to me, well, that's crazy. Well, it's not crazy. It's just that our children understand what you don't understand, which is that detentions are good for them. And they want them. They want to be held in line. Children push, we push back. That's what any good parent or any good teacher has known for millennia. That is what you do. Now, if you're, however, as I say, if you're under pressure from other people to lower your standards, then who misses out? The disadvantaged kids. Because the good, the families, 
who maybe only have one kid or who have a nanny or who can hire tutors and so on, they will always make up for the school's failings. The families that cannot make up for the school's failings are the families who are disadvantaged. And so those, it's not that they're complacent. We come back to that other question of yours. It's not that the, it's not that the schools are complacent. It's that they just go about not really thinking about these things and the children who suffer the most are the disadvantaged kids. If you want to bring the disadvantaged kids on, you have to hold your standards high for everyone. And so in terms of what it looks like here, we have silent corridors, for instance. People think, oh my goodness, why do you have silent corridors? Well, we're in the inner city. And I defy anybody, go to an inner city school where they're not manning the corridors. You will see kids' heads being pummeled into the wall, fights breaking out all over the place, where children are physically unsafe. There are some inner city schools where the teachers are terrified to go, the teachers, not the kids, the teachers are terrified to go in the corridors because they are unsafe. Have silence, and it's really easy. The children in a minute and a half do their transition to lessons. You know, when, um, when the pimp pips went a moment ago and you heard our transition, what you didn't hear in the background in our school was ah! and loads of noise and loads of fighting. You didn't hear anything. All you heard were the pips. And the reason for that is because the children move quickly in silence to their lessons. And when you've got children who at 11 years old have the reading age of a six year old, you need as much time in that lesson as possible to catch them up. So in many schools that are you know, in challenging areas, You've got a 10 minute transition, 15 minutes, child walks in late, slams the door open. The teacher has only just managed to settle everybody to get them working and everybody erupts into laughter. That is not good teaching and it's not good leadership. My role as a, as a leader in schools is to make sure that my teachers have an environment where they can teach. And if the children arrive calm, ready to learn, not all wound up because they've been fighting in the corridors, then that's a good thing, isn't it? However, there are all sorts of people out there who attack me for having corridors that are silent. And they think it's because we hate children. They hate silence. The other thing is silence can be beautiful. It doesn't mean the children are oppressed. It means that when they get into their lessons, they put their hands up, they're totally engaged and they get what's going on. They're there learning as opposed to thinking about, she called me this in the corridor and I'm gonna get her after lunch and so on. They're not thinking that because none of that happened, right? I, I genuinely, it, it shocks me that this is controversial, that a, a school in a disadvantaged area wouldn't want to have silent corridors. But people don't know. You know, the thing is, they have no idea what, what disadvantaged families, what I said at the beginning. They've never met these people. They don't know what it's like. So our parents are very grateful for what we're doing for the children because they know they can send them here in the morning and they're safe. They're in classrooms where they can learn and they go back home feeling empowered because of the day they've had at school. Catherine, your critics paint you in all kinds of lights that they talk about the way that the schools run with military-like precision. And of course, that imagery that you've alluded to about the whole trunch ball picture. But of course, what they're neglecting is that you've got a far more holistic uh, perspective about how you develop children there too. The school's motto is work hard, be kind. What, what motivates you to have that motto for the school? Yes. So we teach them gratitude. We teach them kindness and we expect kindness to each other. So uh, the culture, and we talked about the power of culture, the culture of the school is for the children to look after each other and to be kind to each other. So if, for instance, in a typical uh, inner city environment where they don't have these, this kind of culture, uh, if a child were to drop a plate in the dining hall in that kind of environment, Everyone would start howling and going, Aah! that's what happens in an inner city school when they drop a plate. Here, if a child drops a plate, five or six other children will run to help them pick up stuff and, and look after them. So there isn't this kind of um, abusive uh, culture that exists elsewhere because we are very much about teaching them kindness and they look after each other and that's what happens. Of course, if you are in a strict environment, you can teach kindness. The problem with when you don't have a strict environment is that it's very difficult to teach kindness because you're spending your days chasing the behavior incidents. Remember the head who I mentioned who had all those behavior incidents? Well, how could his pastoral team be talking about kindness? They're just running after all those behavior incidents all of the time. When you don't have any behavior incidents like that, well, then you have time and you have 
the culture where kindness can, can, can flourish. Now, we'll have to talk, of course, about what happens inside the classroom because that's what really, really counts as well. And I want to talk a little bit about what's taught and also how it's taught. And obviously those things are linked, but, but not quite the same. As on what's taught, you know, like much of the English speaking world, we've got a curriculum here in Australia that you can broadly call skills rich more than knowledge rich. What is it that makes a knowledge rich curriculum something that's critical in schools like yours? Yeah, so there we're saying about, uh, you know, when I say back to basics and all that sort of thing, I talk about tradition, that's what you're saying, a knowledge rich curriculum. So uh, the, the, the discussion that's had between knowledge and skills, this is the debate. And people say, well, we want children to be skilled, so we need to be teaching them skills. Well, actually, if you want them to be skilled, you need to teach them knowledge. So we all want the same things. We want children to leave school highly skilled. It's just that the thing that's going to get them there is the knowledge. So, um, for instance, uh, if you don't learn your times tables off by heart, you're not going to be able to do more complex maths problems later. <laughs> and if you just jump in there and say, what we need are real world, world math problems, then um, you're not going to be able to do them. And then you're just going to spend lots of time you know, uh, kids teaching each other, trying to figure it out. And the, the, the kids who are brighter in the class will be able to figure it out. The kids who aren't so bright or who come from more disadvantaged families <laughs> are not going to be able to figure it out because they haven't got parents at home helping them. And so that then means that nobody's teaching them the stuff in the lesson and they fall behind. So when the knowledge is central, uh, what happens is the teacher thinks to themselves, I've got to give them the information. I've got to give them the knowledge. Now, I know lots of people think, well, of course the teacher has to give them the knowledge. That really isn't something that happens in schools nowadays. What happens is children are in groups with desks grouped together and the children are sort of teaching each other and it's what's called child-centered learning. And the teacher moves amongst the group desks as a facilitator of learning as opposed to being a teacher and keeps them on task. And the problem with that is when it's child centered, the children who are supported at home will be just about OK. The other children fall behind. If, on the other hand, the knowledge is central and the teacher knows that they have to impart the knowledge, all children in the class are given equal chance at learning that knowledge. Now, that doesn't mean you don't do anything with that knowledge. People think to themselves, well, that's just rote learning. It isn't rote learning. It's giving them lots of knowledge, which can then be analyzed. You can do turn to your partner, quick pair work. You get them to analyze that stuff in an essay. You have class discussion. That's all fine, as long as the teacher has given them the knowledge in the first place. If you haven't told them anything, then the children who, because we have this understanding, sadly, comes from Rousseau. Rousseau had this idea that you would draw the, the knowledge out of the child. And it sounds very romantic and seductive. Actually, you're not filling their minds. It's them who have it inside them and you need to draw it out. But actually there isn't anything inside them. You've got to put it there. And what teachers need to understand that if, if, the if you ask them a question that they're able to answer and you haven't given them that knowledge, then somebody else did. And likely it is their parents who gave them that knowledge. And if the child doesn't have parents who has that knowledge, English is a second language. They're coming from a family where the mother is never there. Dad isn't around. Mom's working all the time. Whatever it is, the child is not able to garnish that information from their parents. And then they sit in the lesson feeling stupid because the teacher hasn't given them that knowledge. So knowledge needs to be central so that all children in your classroom have equal chance at being able to answer that question. So relatedly is, is of course, how how content is taught. And you've you've touched upon that a bit in that in in your response, but is teacher-led instruction really drill and kill? Is it what makes teach, effective teacher-led instruction superior to some of the alternatives out there? Yeah, so like I say, if children are teaching each other, then the children who haven't got that knowledge from somewhere else are just sort of left behind. Not only that, but you've got to be able to trust your kids to really do the work, and kids are kids. So they'll tend to start talking about who they fancy and what they're doing at the weekend and so on. They don't actually do the work. Um, they're also not experts at the knowledge. So they're not hearing from the one expert in the class who is the teacher. Ideally, they should be exposed as much as possible to what the teacher knows because the teacher knows more than they do. So uh, now the, the, the 
as you said, the caricature is this idea of rote learning. I mean, I, I've never seen a lesson in my life where children are just sat there parroting back what the teacher says. I mean, you want to be able to have a discussion with the kids, right? I mean, obviously, but they need to have some knowledge to be able to have that discussion. Now, you can scaffold that knowledge. So you can give them a little bit of knowledge and then ask them a question to see if it takes them a little bit further. And then if you see, oh, actually, they're not really getting it, you scaffold a little bit more. That's the expertise of the teacher coming in and what makes a, distinguishes a good teacher from a bad teacher, which is that they're constantly scaffolding, pulling the scaffolding away, but giving some more, pulling it away. Just seeing how far you can take the kids to be able to push them while you are controlling that situation. Um, but obviously at the start with younger children, and with a child who is t starting a, d a discipline, right? So they're starting to learn French for the first time. You have got, I mean, imagine if you're learning French, but we're not gonna teach you any of the vocabulary. You all just sit together and teach each, each other the vocabulary. Well, how are they gonna do that? They don't know any French. Now, it seems pretty obvious when I'm talking about French, but when it comes to talking about say English or history, that people don't see it that way. They sort of think, oh no, we can teach this and that in this, the kids can teach themselves. It's exactly the same. If, if you haven't told them that there once was a second world war and when it existed, well, how are they meant to know, right? Like you, you, you need to tell them. So it, it, you tell them, then you discuss it. Then you have interesting conversations. Kids say interesting things about it. You say, oh, that's an interesting point, Johnny. What, what does somebody else think about that? You can have that discussion but knowledge from the teacher is central to that discussion. Taking a question here from Clem from our audience. Okay, despite having great whole class instruction, what do you do at Michaela for struggling learners who are still not, for, not meeting the, the rest of the class, despite all of the best practices that you can muster, what are the additional intervention steps that you have? Yeah, okay, now first of all, I would say when you teach in this way, all of those learners, nearly all of those learners, uh, do keep up because you're explaining properly, because you are supporting, because you're giving them all the knowledge, because you are not doing the child-centered stuff. So you'll find that all of those learners who would elsewhere have been kids who couldn't keep up, that just isn't the case here. But obviously sometimes there are genuine cognitive difficulties there. So, or kids who've been really badly taught before they come here. So we have an extra phonics class, for instance. We have an extra reading club after school where children who cannot read are in that, and they're 11 years old and they can't read, right? They, they are functionally illiterate. They're in that extra class. Uh, you know, you might have certain kids who need to be pulled out of French, for instance, and we do extra English with them and extra maths. We also stream our classes. So we have the top set, middle sets, and then the bottom set. So the bottom set class, for instance, do slightly different subject and they do lots and lots of English and maths because they need that to be able to have a successful life. Whereas the top set might not need so much English and maths and they can do other subjects as well. So uh, we'll talk a bit about getting and keeping best teachers. So of course, no school head can do everything themselves. And you've obviously uh, got a whole lot of the school's culture is, is embedded in yourself as the leader, but of course there's a whole team behind you supporting that work David asks, what's the approach to staff selection and professional development at Michaela? Yeah, so once a week, we have uh, an hour and a half of continuing professional development CPD that we do, where we discuss things depending on what the school needs at the time. But we won't just discuss teaching methods. We'll even discuss philosophy and politics and so on, because I want my staff to understand the values of the school and why we think the way that we do. So we do that once a week, uh, uh, every, every week. Um, we also do tons of observations of each other. So there's a culture of observations where nobody's, you know, there aren't any grades or anything like that. The teachers, and we use our phones. We don't let the kids use phones. We use our phones. We go into the classroom at the back of the classroom. We have the phone and we do a little quick observation, 10, 15 minutes. We give the feedback to the teacher and we copy on the head of the department. I will also see this, this, this feedback. And so I have a sense of how things are going on across the school. And this happens so often that it's no big deal and everybody's sharing good practice in that way. And so if you were to come to Makeda, you would see that there was real consistency across the classrooms and you'd think, gosh, isn't it weird? Everybody says to the kids tracking me, everybody says counts out the books when they're being handed out. There are certain routines that all Makeda teachers do. And, um, and it means that consistency uh, gives the child a sense of predictability in, in a safe environment, 
so that they then feel all the more um, adventurous about putting their hands up, pushing the boat out and really extending their learning. Um, when I hire people, I say to staff when they come here, today isn't just about us figuring out whether we want you, it's about you figuring out whether you want us. And I'm very clear, if you're not happy to give a detention for not having a pen, you don't wanna to come to the school because you're gonna be miserable. And I'm really clear about the things I think they might not like about the school. So it means that my teachers are all bought in to what we are because, uh, I mean, I've had teachers who come for interview and then because of the things I say to them, they say, you know what? Two hours later, they say, you know, the school isn't right for me. And I say, brilliant, off you go. You know, I'll find somebody who, who does match with us. So uh, retaining and keeping a, a quality workforce is, is challenging in all schools, but, uh, and a lot of the discussion tends to follow about wages and conditions. At least education unions tell us that these are effectively the things that really count about why teachers stay in the workforce. But is there more to it? Is there more to getting and keeping a high performing and committed workforce? Yes, much more to it. Um, you know, we don't even have a car park for staff, right? And yet my staff come, come, come to school, you know? Uh, they either have to take public transport or they have to park far away and walk 10 minutes to get to school. Um, we, I don't pay our teachers more than normal and so on. Uh, that we, we, we actually, our teachers in that sense are far worse off than teachers at other schools. But the main thing that destroys a teacher's wish to live is behavior. You know, being told to F off regularly every day, having chairs thrown at you, having things done to you, and then the, the senior management never take it seriously. It's horrible. Nobody wants to work in that kind of environment. So that's the number one thing. If you get that right, which we get right, teachers are happy. The second thing is workload. P teachers do not want to spend their time doing loads of work that's totally useless. Now, I wouldn't say our teachers don't work hard. They do work hard. But everything they do has impact on the kids. And they can see that. And they can see they have purpose. What makes people happy and driven in life, in all walks of life, is purpose. And our teachers have purpose because they know that everything they do is having impact on the children. And they're able to be warm and friendly and funny and, and have great relationships with the kids precisely because of our strict environment. If, on the other hand, you're having to shout at kids all the time, tell them off, and you feel like you're in a battle all the time, that's not a very nice life. So unions are wrong to say that it's all about money. And then unions in this country actually deny that there is a behavior problem in schools. And I'm always thinking, sorry, in what way are you supporting your members in, in, in denying that there is a behavior problem in schools? You know, there is too much of a behavior problem and it isn't fair that teachers get the brunt of that. And um, it is up to us school leaders to make it so that they are supported in the classroom. And that's about doing things that are difficult you know, being called Miss Trunchbull and so on. Then, and, and that's a shame. It's a real shame that our society, uh, that our culture, the power of culture in 2021 in Western countries is such that as a head teacher, you have to really be quite brave to stand against the orthodoxy and to do things differently. At 50, 60 years ago, what we do here was perfectly normal. I only wish it could be normal again. You've obviously got a model that's working there in Michaela, but the question of course becomes, how would you scale that elsewhere? And, and thanks Grant for your question on this. How would you scale what's happening in Michaela? Is it something that you could replicate elsewhere? Absolutely, it is being replicated all the time. Uh, I have a de deputy who used to be here. He's gone off and done things in other schools. The three, I had three head teachers in here the other day who have copied essentially much of the stuff that we are doing. Uh, ordinary classroom teachers. The reason why we get 600 visitors a year is because classroom teachers come here and head teachers come here. They take ideas and they make them happen in their schools. The thing is, is that you need to come here and you need to see what's going on. And then you can take the ideas back. And I have letter after letter of people saying, thank you so much. It's really made a difference to our school. So absolutely these ideas can be taken elsewhere um, and have been taken elsewhere and make a difference, not just to disadvantaged kids, but to all types of children. Because at the end of the day, kids are kids and kids need us to lead and we need to not be scared of leading. And the stuff I say about parents, parents need not to be friends with their, with their kids. They need to put them, they're in a position of authority. The teacher is in a position of authority where we lead and you expect your child to meet your standards always. If you put your standards here, child will meet you there. Put your standards there, 
Child will meet you there. It's all about what we do in our positions as in, in an authoritative position as a parent or a teacher. Now, we're just about out of time, but we want, we want to get some takeaways from you, Catherine, about what schools in Australia can do to replicate the success in Michaela so that students in Australia can overcome the odds. So what are the takeaways for Australia's principals and teachers um, to help our dis disadvantaged students to achieve similar success? Yeah, well, discipline and teaching, those are the two big things. You know, don't let the small things go on the discipline. You need centralized systems in your school to make sure that everybody's holding their standards high. And don't get scared, as senior leadership, don't get scared of the parents. You think, oh, the parents are gonna tell me off if I tell their child off. No, keep your standards high. And if the parents are, have too low expectations, then tell the parents that their expectations are too low. And then in terms of teaching, We've got to move away from this progressive way of doing things, of letting children lead the learning. The teacher needs to lead the learning. The teacher needs to give the knowledge to the kids. That, if you could do those two things, you will transform your school. Well, that's all we have time for today. To be continued, I'm sure. From everyone here at the CIS, a big thanks, Catherine, for what was a great discussion. I hope you enjoyed it too. Okay, thanks very much for having me. Now for decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working tirelessly to deliver evidence-based public policy, especially in the critical area of education. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. CIS relies solely on the generosity of people like you to help us advance our cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. I look forward to seeing you next time here at the CIS. Bye for now.